welcome to Borgens with Niramas, the podcast. I'm Joseph, I'm here with Draco. Well, Draco doesn't really say that much, but we are back for the second episode of the podcast. It is March, we are sort of a little bit late, but ah, who cares? We're putting it out there, you can listen to it, I hope you will enjoy it. And in a little while here, we are going to have a chat together with James Stegmeier, uh, of course, Stonemaier Games, famous designer, he's you know, created some of my favorite games, uh, some of my top 100 games that I really enjoy. So I had a nice chat with him and he has a new release here as well, the Red Rising game. Uh, that is, I think it's, you know, it's out there for pre-ordering right now as well. And it was really fun chatting with him and you can hear that in a while. But first of all, I do want to start off the podcast as I usually do. Well, usually this is the second episode, but you get the idea. I am going to talk a bit about what's happening lately here in on my side of the world, the Swedish West Coast. And it, it's a bit, little bit, it's going to be a little bit depressing, but stick with me. There's also uh, the bright side of things. But, you know, Swedish winter, I, I don't like Swedish winter. I shouldn't be living here at all. Actually, I should be living in a country that, or in a part of the world that is more warm. Um, I'm not a winter person. I don't ski. I don't, you know, ice skate. I, I'm not that interested in that type of activity. So, you know, the snow was, I think, like whole January, February. It's been snow. It's been like so cold. I mean, it's been cold all over, uh, I think. <laughs> but it's been rough for me. And, and combined, I mean, normally, you know, I don't like, normally in a Swedish winter, it's, it's dark, it's cold, uh, and the snow and everything. I usually get a little bit depressed, but then this year it's been worse than usual, just because, you know, the combination of not being able to sit inside indoors uh, with friends, gaming or hanging out and so on. Uh, so the lockdown combined with winter has been really rough for me. And it's also taken a toll on me when it comes to my content creation, you know, YouTube and so on. I haven't really put out that much stuff. Um, then again, also, and this is not new for this year, it's been like every year since I started doing YouTube, you know, back in 2016, uh, that this time of year, it's it's going down, like the views are going down and, and so on. I don't know why. I mean, people are indoors a lot, so I, I, it doesn't really make sense to me. But I also watch some analytic stuff from other channels, and they seem to be having the same thing there. So I, I don't know what's that about. Maybe it's because there's not that many games released this time of year. And then when we get like closer to the summer and like it's, it's usually, you know, Gen Con and then it's Essen and then it's the high point of the year is like between Essen and New Year's Eve. That's like when I get like most of the views or, or you know, commitment to the like comments and, and people are engaging with my content and all that. But yeah, I, I don't worry too much about that. I'm very happy where I am when it comes to YouTubing. Um, I mean, of course, it's fun if the channel grows. It's fun if, you know, more people are watching the videos. But I don't really worry that much about it because it's... I'm doing it because I enjoy it. And, you know, I, I have a great support from the community that are following me. I have a great support from, like, you know, publishers that I have, you know, good relations with, with a lot of people in the industry. And, and that makes me happy. And so I have a bunch of new games, of course. Uh, lately, I have played some games not that many though I've been really again I, I play a lot of werewolf on zoom that's what I do with most of my time it feels like and I had such a good time I'm, I'm moderating a lot these days and uh, the group and everything it's such a good group I, we're having such a good time again if you're listening to this if you want to you know join the group um, Dice Tower Werewolf group on Facebook it started by Tom Vassell uh, from the Dice Tower that's that's the name there. And, you know, I play once a week. I play uh, in games that Tom hosts as well. And and then I host my own games. And there's a lot of people hosting. It's not just Werewolf either. It's like Blood on the Clock Tower. We play Board Game Arena. And some people play like Tabletop Simulator and all that. I'm, I don't really... I don't know. I should get into it. But I haven't done it. It just feels so... <laughs> it feels like such a hurdle to just get over. To just get into the, like, oh, I have to drag stuff around. I have to pan and zoom and yeah. It's not that hard though. I think I could get into it if I tried. And then also my own game, Draco's Adventures, is a bit delayed. I need to find the energy really. I have like a little bit of work left to do. I need to finish up the rule book. I need to make the Kickstarter page. So I, I just moved it to April, like uh, last week of April. That's the plan now. I hope that can happen. I think it can. I think I have like maybe 10, 15 hours of work, so to speak, to just like 
finish it up and then it could go on Kickstarter. And then of course, after that, I also have some time to, I mean like the rule book, I could make a draft for the Kickstarter, right? And then I could do like, I need to like make sure that the English is good and you know, all that. And one thing I will say that I've done lately that I am a bit proud of myself because for years now I've been saying and thinking uh, that I need to, you know, get better at like, um, you know, photo editing and like making my thumbnails and all that. I, I have actually done that. I have started to do some stuff with that. Like I'm using GIMP, which is a free software. It's sort of like Photoshop, I think. I'm not good at this at all, but I started just learning some basics. Um, just trying to brush up my thumbnails a little bit. Like if I do a thumbnail of an actual board game when Draco sits next to the box, then I just keep, you know, I like the style I have there. I, I will keep doing that. But then when I do like a digital play or something, I don't just want to put up a picture of like the game art. It, it just feels boring. I want to be able to uh, do a little bit more, like have it on the side, have my own text or, you know, like the Draco cartoons or something like I'm trying to work a little bit on that. And, and also with the editing, I have discovered in my editing program that of course I can set key binds. This sounds so silly. I sound like my dad, like when I was 15 and I was doing like programming and making web websites and like playing a lot. And, and back then, of course, that was like the late 90s. That was like not that many people were good at handling computers. And I consider myself being good at handling computers <laughs> back then. I mean, these days I feel like my dad back then, like, well, wow, I discovered a new function here in Windows, which is what I did. Like in my editing software, I realized, well, I can just keybind everything. So like I don't need to use my mouse that much, which kind of speeded up my my editing process, which I do like. Uh, anything that, you know, can make it smoother is good, of course. And I am doing like, of course, I'm, you know, doing my podcast, my Swedish podcast, Snacka Bredspil, with my friends, Mats and Andreas. And I have a lot of fun with that one. Uh, in the latest episode, we did something funny there where we did, uh, we ranked our top games from A to Z, which is just like, like the name of the game as a starting letter. And that was really fun. I, I've been considering doing that maybe for YouTube as well, or for like doing it in English, because I already have the list, I already made the list, so I could do that. Um, you know, let me know if that's something you would like to hear. If you don't understand Swedish, then, you know, I could do that in English as well. I may, maybe I do it in this podcast as well. But yeah, those kind of, I, I also think like those kind of videos, if I do like a video on YouTube with like a top list or something, I could put it out just to, this, just the audio, put it out as a podcast in my feed as well. Like I did that with the top five games we never get to the table list. I did with Alex uh, Radcliffe. That was really fun. So I put that on the feed here as well. So you can find it, uh, you know, next to this episode, basically. And I will, will also record, in a few days, we will record the top five video games we would like to see as board games. So we're going to do that. And then I'll put the video of me and Alex on YouTube. Or actually, it's going to be on his channel. It's going to be on his channel, Board Game Co. And then I can just use the audio to put up as a podcast. So, you know, you can listen to it on my podcast as well. All right, well, enough of uh, backstory here. Let's get into the chat I had with Jamie Stegmeier. It's going to be fun. And after it, we're going to do some questions and answers and talk a little bit about the future. So, hey, Jamie, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on. I mean, I've been playing your games for, for years and, and also followed you in the whole, like, on YouTube and, and your your all your like how to make a Kickstarter uh, video and uh, videos and like all the guides you've been doing. Oh, thank you. I followed your content for a long time as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And uh, I'm so impressed. I, I must, you know, begin with some nice words here and say that I'm, I'm so impressed on how you bring a, a like a, a easy to grab and clear and, and, and good sort of structure to how like when you're designing a game, you're very open about it, telling like step by step and informing the community and, and your fans on, on on your upcoming games and so on. It's, it's I, I I assume that's a process you've been like aiming for, like step by step. Yeah, thank you. I, mean, I I I guess I've learned so much by reading these types of things or watching these types of things from other people, from watching reviews, from watching playthroughs, the types of things that you do, and watching. Uh, designers talk about their process or publishers talk about that process that I've kind of taken the same approach so that hopefully maybe someone will learn something that from from my experiences as well yeah and and I, I would like to start by asking you a little bit about your background and and how you sort of 
did did you game a lot as a kid or when, when did you find the love for board gaming i i was fortunate i think as a kid that my parents did expose me to a lot of different games um when i was younger and so i was playing chess i played scotland yard uh risk a key to the kingdom um millborn played a fair amount of magic as a, as a teenager so a little bit all over the place growing up and then i returned to gaming well, i didn't return i didn't ever really leave gaming but i played a lot of poker after college for a few years oh, and then okay. i got into Catan and agricola and then stone age and then deep into the the modern hobby especially modern euro games yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have a similar background there because i had a bunch of years yeah. where i was into the whole poker scene as well and and yeah it was a relief to go back, sort of, for rediscovering board gaming, and there's no money involved, there's no stress. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's kind of weird that it's money is so it it's so inherent to poker, but I never think about when I play a board game. When I play, you, you have Terraforming Mars behind you. When I play that, I don't ever think of playing for money. No, no, exactly. Yeah, and and the whole like it, just just sit around and just have a good time. Like I mean, I can be right. competitive in games. But it's not the main goal, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same here. Yeah, I, I I love to win a game if I play well. Uh, but I'm there to have fun and to interact with friends. Yeah, exactly. And then you you made uh, Stonemire games. Do you want to tell yeah, us a little bit more on on how that process? Uh... Yeah, it it kind of it started in 2011 when. Um, there were some board game projects that were successfully funding on Kickstarter. And I had this hobby of my love of board games and I designed games off and on throughout my whole life just for fun. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll take this passion that I have for Kickstarter and entrepreneurship and I'll try to combine it with my love of designing games. And so I designed Viticulture and then it successfully funded on Kickstarter in 2012. So 2012 is kind of the unofficial or I would say the official time that my company started. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's where it started. And and that was the, and that's just, that game has gone through a few different iterations, right? In, in yes. ended up in the essential edition. Yeah, I've I've learned a lot. I think about trying to get the game right the first time. Uh, since then, um, Viticulture was a game that had the first edition, then the second edition, and then for the last six years, the essential edition. That's the 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 correct version of the game, I think. Um, but I've ever, ever since then, I've tried to try to get the games right the first time. Aside from maybe a few typos here and there, but get the core gameplay right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I really love the. A lot of people do, but I really love the Tuscan expansion and all that. Oh, adds. Thank you. Uh, and of course, the base game in itself. I mean, I almost feel like these days that's something I can bring, sort of like a gateway-ish game, like to people who are new to worker placement and so on. They can get into the the mechanics in by base game viticulture. Yeah, that's that's my approach too. I think a lot of people when they talk about kicks when they talk about viticulture, they talk about Tuscany right away, how much they love Tuscany. They want to introduce that to people. And I love that. But I still when I teach someone viticulture for the first time, I just use viticulture. I think it's easier to learn and teach that way. Yeah. And then they can have that excitement when they add the Tuscany board later. But speaking of viticulture, by the way, did you did you play the, the digital Im implementation? A little bit. I, I've toyed around with it. I don't, I don't play the, the digital versions of our games all that much, but I played it a little bit. I, I think they did a pretty good job with it, but I'm hoping they add some more elements to it over time. Have you, yeah. have you played it? Yeah, I did, I did a playthrough, and, and I, mm -hmm. I liked, of course, I liked the gameplay because that was video culture, um, but I, I thought they could have, you know, the looks of the game weren't that great. Uh, so, on, like, the actual board game looks yeah. great. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, speaking of which, I mean, this last year, of course, everyone's been been sitting at home and so on. Have, are you playing anything on like board, board game arena or tabletop simulator and so on? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very grateful for for having gotten into board game arena over this past year. Uh, I I do appreciate Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. I work with both of those companies quite a, a bit to get our games on their platforms. But I love that board game arena knows what all the pieces are. It has that intelligence to it. Yeah. Um, yeah which makes it really helpful. So my game night, my weekly game night has switched almost entirely to a virtual game night using Board Game Arena. Do you have any yeah. uh, favorite games over there you can? Yeah, uh, a few. Well, one of my recent favorites that I played on there is Quetzal. Have you played Quetzal on Board Game Arena? No. Huh? It's a worker placement game that has kind of an auction element to the worker placement. It's Q-U-E-T-Z-A-L. Um, I'd never heard of it before I played it there. 
I also love <laughs> Russian Railroads on there. Oh, and yeah. Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders plays like a filler game on there. It's like a 10-minute game. On oh, there yeah. Right it's now. so quick. Yeah. Yeah. What, do you have some favorites on, on that platform? Well, well, lately I've been playing a lot of Saboteur, uh, oh, which yeah. is a, a small card game. I, I Again, I haven't played it in physical form before, and, and I heard about it at some point, but it's right. a really fun, like, it's, it's basically social deduction uh, right. with cards. And then yeah. last night we played the the second version. They have the the Saboteur two on there as well. And oh, that, cool! And that was like stepping up. Yeah, you know that was a lot of different roles and effects, and it was so much fun. And that's a new favorite. Oh, cool! I'll have to, I haven't tried it on there. I played it, I think, once in real life, but uh, yeah, I'll have to try it on board game arena. I mean, some games even are, I feel like are easier to play, or at least you know in some ways better actually. When you like, especially these. Yeah. These small sort of card style games and so on, where if you play them in right. real life, there's a lot of shuffling and and upkeep. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, if, there, if there's a lot of shuffling, a lot of upkeep. If the setup time takes a long time compared to the length of the game, or uh, like we played Res Arcana last night. Oh yeah, and yeah. at Res Arcana, you need to be aware constantly of how many points your opponents have. Yeah, and uh, Board Game Marina does a great job of easily showing you those points at all times. And and also, I mean, in Resarcana, when I played it in real life, or in real life, it's a weird expression, but <laughs> uh, when you're sitting around the table, yeah, and and sure, we were new and so on, but it's all 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 the time. It's like, oh wait, what what does that card do that you have over there? What can you do with that? Like, can you right. attack me with that? And then on Morgan Marina, I can just hover over with my mouse. Okay, they have this and that, and yeah, uh, yeah, that hover is especially for those games with lots of icons. That that yeah. hover really really helps. I still, I only played it still a few times, and I, I will play it more because I really like it. And but it, I think I feel like it's one of the games, just like Race for the Galaxy, that like you need to play over and over to, to get into right. how to think. And but I do like the race element in that game where you you, you feel a little bit stressed uh, from like yeah. the midway point, like oh, is someone gonna just run away with this? <laughs> yeah. Is one of the big news that came out yesterday? Since you're talking about this, did you hear that Asmodee has purchased? Board game yeah. arena. Yeah. What do you think I mean, about that? I don't know what to think. I mean, I, you know, I try to be positive. I hopefully that just means that there will be more games and more development of the platform. Which right. I, I read somewhere that they increased. I think it was six hundred percent in in user uh, activity during twenty twenty, and that makes sense, obviously. Yeah. So yeah, I th I think it's great. I, I think also. I I mean. Some people, well, we talk about the vaccine, we talk about like the time after <laughs> this time. Uh -huh. But I mean, I got so many new friends, like especially you know, like Americans and, and people from the UK and so on. I will, yeah. I will want to keep playing with those people even after, you know, even when I can go to my regular game work. So, yeah. Of That's course, a good point. yeah, we'll be interested afterward if, if when we get back to in person game nights, if we'll also continue having the virtual game nights. Uh, because I can, I like you said that I, I will miss, I I, I will miss that because I played the virtual game nights with people all over the country and all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope so because it's, it's especially since it's such a good format. Like I, I mean, I talked about this before, but like if someone would have asked me, I don't know, you know, a year or, or more, like ago, if yeah, do you want to play something online? I would have been no. That's that's not why I'm into board gaming. I'm into board gaming to sit around a table, right? Right. But it, it actually works so well. And, and also, like I, I, I still haven't gotten into the whole tabletop simulator that much because yeah. you, know, you have to drag stuff around. It feels like it takes a long time. And I realize that it's just a matter of practice. Like if I, if I did it, I would get into it. But Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do it for playtesting if I need to. Um, and if I really want to learn a game, I could do it there. But it, it like you said, it. well, I think you made a good point. It, it takes practice, but... At this point, I haven't put in that practice, so it takes so long to play games on there. Yeah, I, I know there's shortcuts. You can do these keyboard shortcuts, so you can zoom in and you can. Yeah. But but uh, yeah, all right. Well, I I obviously I am curious about your new game that you uh, recently yeah. announced, Red Rising. Yeah. yeah. This is our first game based on a a pretty major IP, a book series that I that I read and loved have loved for many years now okay have you read the yeah. books have no I, this is totally new to me i uh -huh. i don't know if it's uh well i'm not gonna it's obviously 
in Sweden as well. I mean, they probably translated it and so on. I uh, couldn't imagine anything else. But I, I will say, though, that I'm not really reading that many books these days, sadly. Mm. I'm, uh -huh. It's like audiobooks, basically, in, in the background sure. while I play <laughs> stuff on, <laughs> on the computer. Uh -huh. But I, I am interested. I like the... I mean, just as I read your, your um, press release and, and the whole thematic background here, it sounds really interesting. Yeah. It, I, well, thank you. Yeah, I did. It's, it's a, a, a dystopian world that I just I really captured me. And I have been trying for years to get the, a combination of getting the rights and also uh, figuring out a game design that I thought would work well for this world. And I finally figured it out with a co-designer, my, my, my coworker, Alex Schmidt, a few years ago. Yeah. And I'm looking at your um, your web page here, and it it looks nice. And I, I I mean, obviously, just in the press released email, actually, you said something about like combo building and hand management, and that's like I'm interested right away because it sounds like <laughs> my kind of game. Uh, I always talk about this this combo wombo, as I call it in 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 games. Uh -huh. That's my favorite part of a game where I can chain actions into other actions, right? Oh, nice, yeah. Have you played uh, Fantasy Realms? No, I haven't. I saw you mentioned okay. it here as a combo building game, and I have to look that up. I, I heard a name, but it's it's mm. one of those games that have slipped on the radar. I played Gugong a bit, uh, quite a bit though, and and yeah. in, that I really like that sort of worker placement style where you place a card and then you pick up another card. And that yeah, that's and that's the the core system of Red Rising. You're you're deploying a character card from your hand, and almost always activating its deployability. And then you pick another location on the board, similar also to Gugong, and you're picking up a card from that location. And when you do, you gain the bonus of that location. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's almost a bit of, uh, I'm, I, I think of um, uh, Raiders of the North Sea, where you like play something and yes. then pick up something. That's also Very one of my similar, favorite yeah. things in that game with, with the whole twist on worker placement. I always love when, you know, you find a new way to do a, a sort of mechanism that you already love, and and yeah, and Shem Phillips of uh, who designs those games is I think Architects is my favorite of his series. But every game, there's just some interesting twist on worker placement. I I, I love what he's doing at Garp Hill. Yeah, I I think I'm in a minority there. I I, I still hold Raiders as much as my favorite. You do oh, okay. <laughs> I do like Paladins as well, though. Uh, Paladins uh -huh. of the West Kingdom. And, and Architects is okay, but I'm not, I don't know. Everybody loves Architects. Uh, I only played it twice and, and basically oh, okay. I, I tried going around uh, grabbing everyone's meeples and putting them in jail and that I didn't win that <laughs> way. It was just fun. So, yeah. yeah that, it's interesting that you took that approach. I just like piling up workers, more workers and more workers and getting better and better benefits in that game. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's, I, can't, I guess it also depends on the game group. Or like, I mean, right. I... I guess if I play that game a lot, I would probably like it more. Uh, so, yeah, that's true. But there's too many games uh, overall, yeah. and I always constantly. I think you're in the same position, right? You try new games all the time, and yeah, but yeah. I have a few on my shelf right now. I'm playing. I just started playing Sleeping Gods from oh, Red Raven Games. Yeah. I'm having a great time with that. But I also just received uh, uh, Everdell, which I played once, but I haven't played it in years. I really want to return to that. And then there's something I'm looking over at my Kickstarter pile over here. Uh, where's the other game? I just got some other game that I that I want to play and I'm excited about. Oh, uh, it's a Fox and the Force duet. I, I just got that and want to play it. Oh, is it an? Oh, is it on four players then? Uh, Fox, or, Fox and the Force duet. It's a, it, that's a two player game, right? I, I think I played it's that. It's a two player game. Yeah, it's a cooperative trick taking game. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Did no, you I like it? I don't think it's cooperative. I think it's. Oh, is that cooperative? No, I think it's you're playing against each other, but it's only two. Okay, I there thought... might be two versions of. It. I think there's Fox in the Forest. And oh yeah, Fox yeah, that's the, the duet, duet probably. Is that it's the co-op. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I yeah. I kind of liked it, but I'm not I I not a big trick taking fan. Or for me, it's it feels like you know sitting around uh, on a porch in in summer uh, playing like a, you know standard deck of cards and you play these yeah <laughs> like which is not it's not boring but it's uh -huh. <laughs> not really well then again the crew showed up and then i love the crew so that kind yeah. of broke broke that streak for me with like and i can't see that trick taking 
I think I need to play more of those games. There's a bunch of different, like different types of, like how you win and, and different rules right. and all that. So that, that's probably something I would should get more into. And I mean, I I've been in I've been actively playing board games for I don't know five six years now. But it's still, you know, there's a bunch of games that, like. I hear people talk about it all the time and so on, and I haven't tried them yet, which is fun actually. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> there's still, yeah, still a lot to discover. So, yeah, it, I think we we often get caught up in the new games, and that's great. But I, I like revisiting older games too that that people love and talk about quite a bit. And that's yeah. actually again why why board game arena is so good because I get a chance yeah. to revisit or find older games. So. But back to yeah. uh, Red Rising. So, so the plan here is it's um, it's pre-order in March, I think, right? Yeah. So we've already made the game, um, and we will have a pre-order for the collector's edition on our website in early March, and then we'll start shipping it a few weeks later from our fulfillment centers in the U.S., the U.K., um, Australia, and Canada. And don't worry, even though you're in Sweden and the U.K. isn't in EU anymore, we are we pay the duties up front um, so that you don't have to pay for the duties. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I must say that I haven't really, I saw some some post on Facebook about, I don't know how much it was, but it was a lot of money to, like, if you're going to start ordering things from UK in, to Sweden yeah. these days. Uh, and yeah, that that's a problem. But but so that, that amazed me with Tapestry. I think you had the same structure there, right? With the, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very similar it, structure, yeah. It was so quick. And, and also, I like your structure. From that aspect, that like you announce a game, and then you can actually get the game fairly soon <laughs> <laughs> because you already made the game. Instead of like, oh, I'm gonna make this game. It's gonna take you know one and a half years on Kickstarter <laughs> before. Yeah, Something. and that's really, yeah. I keep coming back to that. I, I still love Kickstarter as a backer. I every now and then I get excited about potentially returning to it. But whenever I think about that as a creator, I'm like, why? I I just so much more happy to like make the product and ship it to you. A few weeks after we start talking about it, or a few weeks after you order it, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm kind of spoiled by this new format at this point. Yeah, well, it's it's really smart as well. I mean, from a marketing perspective, because otherwise I feel like some some games get lost in the mix because like they're really hot and everybody's talking about them when they're on Kickstarter, but then when they deliver, right. everyone you know forgot about them and some you know not that many people play them because it's a huge these huge games with like hundreds of miniatures and you just sit on some shelf somewhere right <laughs> i mean from a from a designer perspective i can imagine that that can't be that exciting to just like oh yeah my game is finally out there i'm so excited for it but you know the hype is already over so you're right it, it is an odd phenomenon but you're, you're I, i've experienced that first time many times i get so excited when it's on kickstarter and then it arrives and i'm like oh, okay I'm, i i'll open it up i'll look at it i'll check it out yeah exactly then, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, that's, I, I do like our method of getting out there while people are still actively excited about it and on that kind of that high, that pre-order high and discovery high. Yeah. And I mean, I'm I'm weird in that way that I, I get very excited for expansions or for new games. And I like, oh, I can't wait to get them to my table. And then I then I have them at home and I'm like, yeah, it's over there. I can play it whenever I want. And right. <laughs> you know, I'm not stressed about playing it. Like, I can admit I still haven't played the Tapestry expansion, and, and I got that. Uh, I think I got it through a friend that or or stole my champion, so he ordered for me as well. Uh, and I that was like, oh, I'm so excited! I'm you know I, I went. I he's living like a thirty minute drive from me, and okay. I you know I drove over to his house as soon as he got got it from the mail, and I like, picked it up and drove home. Uh -huh. And I looked through everything, and you know I think I did an unboxing video, and then something else came in the way you know it's like oh that's another game where i need to film so all of a sudden it and i also did this i think you see that i did like a, a solo playthrough series so i i tried to play yeah. with each civilization and i played six of them so far yeah. and i was so into it and then as soon as i put it away started doing other things then it's sort of I, it's not a hard game to get into i know how to play tapestry but i like i have to commit to like okay now i'm gonna do six more basically right because yeah. because once I get into it, I want to, because I've been doing this, some of my, I don't know, some viewer, viewer suggested in a comment that I should, like, if I, if I win one, then I should increase the difficulty level for the next one. Oh, uh -huh. and I think, I don't remember where, I, I won like three in a row, so I got 
got up there. And that's also like if I'm going to do my number seven now, I have to start up there uh-huh. on whatever level that was. So like I'm a bit scared because <laughs> I don't want to fail instantly when I get back to it. But I will get back at, to it. And, uh, and, and then yeah. you also have what was it, like eight new or something like that in, in the expansion. There was a bunch of new civilizations. There are at least, I think there were 10. Was it 10? Yeah, 10 yeah. total. But there's also a, uh, a solo campaign uh, that people seem to really, really enjoy. I'm not the designer of that, but in the, oh. in the expansion, there's a campaign you can play through in solo mode uh, that I think is five games, maybe five or six games. So that might fit your format too if you're looking to play yeah. a few games in a row. Yeah, I have to do that at some point. But I, I'm, I'm going to you know get back to it. It's the same I have with Terraforming Mars where I did solo playthroughs of all the co- corporations and then uh-huh. term, Turmoil came and I, I used like everything, of course. And then right. it, it got to the point where it's so, it, it, you know, it takes like hours to film and play and then it takes so many hours to edit that video. Uh-huh. So I, I'm, I've done two and I still have, I think, six or seven to go i'm just thinking i'll do one one every six months or something <laughs> okay yeah because uh, editing yeah people don't think about the editing time but how much time do you spend editing a, a video well it depends on the format obviously but but I, I would say most videos i would say about maybe double the time of the video because i'm looking yeah. through it and i'm i'm cutting out pieces here and there when i mess up but when i do solo playthroughs though it is it takes a long time because I'm like all my thinking time is I, I actually you know have to train myself into not making any noise when I'm thinking, which uh, is sort of like without without realizing it, you sit around like, hmm, hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to like train myself into just be quiet and think because uh-huh. by being quiet, it's easier to edit out then. Like I can see on the in editing uh-huh. software, okay, this part here should be just removed uh-huh. because I don't That's want the... I don't want the viewers to sit around and like wait for me to plan my next move too right. much. I mean, a little bit. Like, I mean, I can I come from the. I, I was inspired by Rado when I started, and I I do like that approach that you you get to like hear my thoughts a little bit, or like when I watch yeah. Rado, I want to hear why he's doing what he's doing. I just don't. I don't just want to see it done because then it wouldn't make sense. But at right. the same time, there's a balance in that. You don't want to see like back and forth and. Oh, I go back and I, I redo whatever, and <laughs> right, right. And Rado, he, he must have trained himself over time to just make decisions and not, and not to linger too long in, yeah. on any specific decision. Um, I could see that. Yeah, I because he's not editing point. his videos that much. I think he's not. Yeah, which is amazing in itself that he's doing these like an hour, <laughs> you know, without right. any <laughs> pauses or anything. Uh, yeah. I'll never get to that energy level. I don't intend to either. I mean, I'm just happy. You got to find your own thing, right? Your own yeah. pace. So, yeah, I can I found that a long time ago too with uh, with my channel, where I my videos are usually around five minutes. I focus on one or two things that I love about the game, and I don't edit it. I just upload it, and I I know that I definitely would not have kept up that channel for so long if I did edit, because editing, like you yeah. said, it, it takes at least probably double the time it takes to, to run the video. And I, I just have more fun. I, I'm just more likely to do it if I, if I just ha- can film the video and put it online. And every now and then I mess up and I have to refilm a whole video, but I've gotten pretty good where I could just be okay with a few mistakes and put it online and, and be happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I watch a lot of like John gets games. It's one of my yeah. favorite channels, but I mean, he, and he, he does amazing videos, but I also know that he spends like a week basically on each game. Uh, yeah. You know? So like retakes and and he's like, you know, trying to he's trying to like especially these days he's just doing tutorials so he's trying to like get everything right. in a tutorial so he's scripting like what cards will be drawn and uh, right and I I do that sometimes like if if I I don't know. I cheat a little bit sometimes, like if, if it's some kind of card that an event card or whatever that is too annoying, I, I might just, you know, I'll, I'll just put it at the bottom. I'll draw something else uh, right. to make the video better. Uh, but I, I, I try to keep it genuine. Um, and, and it's also interesting with the, uh, with these days, I, I've gotten way more into uh, live streaming. Yeah. And, and that's the challenge. Like I, I did one recently, they did Terraforming Mars in a live stream in solo mode. 
uh-huh. and you know I can't cheat at all. Like you know, they're watching <laughs> me. <laughs> right. So so about uh, back to Red Rising again. I I would do want to ask you about inspiration. I mean, you talked about the books, but like a mechanical inspiration. How did you find what mechanics would fit this theme and and make it into an actual good game, not just a game about an IP? Well, it was something that I I really struggled with for a long time. I I designed, like, I think this is the fifth version of the game that I designed. And the four previous versions were some combination of worker placement and bag building. Oh, yeah. Um, I think those are the two core mechanisms in it because I was trying to, I was trying to encapsulate this dystopian society that's divided into 14 colors. I was trying to put those colors on the meeples to have 14 different colors of meeples and have oh. those meeples mean different things based on their colors. But uh, that format, I, I just couldn't get it to work in a fun way. I couldn't get it to work in a thematic way. Like it, it just felt like I was um, looking down at the world and looking down at all these workers instead of uh, being immersed in the world and, and making tough decisions as if I were up interacting in the world and so um it was at a game night where i was playing uh fantasy realms i mentioned fantasy realms i was playing that with with my friend alex and it kind of clicked while we were playing the game because in fantasy realms there are 10 different suits there are 10 different colors in the game and we realized okay this game actually made it work it has 10 different colors the colors all feel different but it isn't there aren't there aren't a ton of rules that you need to know like everything that you need to know is written on the cards themselves could we use this a similar format for Red Rising? And we tested it, we tried it, we made some some pretty big changes from um, Fantasy Realms, um, but it worked, and and uh, we took off from there and and, and designed the rest of the game. A, a big part of it too is the the characters. One one thing that I realized is that the, the characters are what I really really love about the Red Rising books. The their personalities, their relationships, the tough decisions they have to make in what is a pretty harsh dystopian world. And so that's what ended up being in the game. There are 112 unique characters and, and you'll see some of them in every game. You probably won't see all of them, but that, that's the decision you're making there throughout the game. You're deciding which characters do I not want in my hand and which characters do I, do I definitely want in my hand so that at the end of the game, they can combo together for as many points as possible. Yeah, I, uh, this, this wolf head tray that I'm looking at here, uh, how, yeah. how is that? Uh... Where does that come from? Is it it's some symbol for the? Yeah, it's a it's a symbol in the game uh, that that refers to one of the houses in the game, and also one of the uh, a, a little group of people called the Howlers. Okay. In, in in Red Rising, yeah. Is it a is it a, um, a bunch of books or how how many? Yeah, it's a it's two trilogies. Okay. Uh, one trilogy uh... is complete books one through three and that, that's what this game is based on and there are no spoilers in the game because we based it on the characters and so there's no oh, yeah. like plot yeah. sto- spoilers spo- story spoilers because i'm really hoping more i'm hoping that gamers discover the books through the game and then uh, the author is working on book six so he has books five four and five of the second trilogy and is, he's writing book six right now all right yeah I'll, i'm gonna have to look it up on my audiobook uh platform cool. <laughs> it's a great audiobook actually the, the narrator does a great job all right yeah well, it's the, I mean, it's the same with like, you know, Game of Thrones, which is one of my favorite stories these days, at least in the, in the books. But I mean, I discovered that through the TV show, obviously. Right. Like I had, and then I went back and read the books like three times or something. So, uh, and yeah, we'll see if those ever finish. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if they will. Do you think it's, is it worth reading the books, even though I've only watched the TV show? I think so, because they... Yeah. I mean, there's other examples like Lord of the Rings, uh, where, right. where I, f- there, I feel like, I don't know if that's controversial, but I feel like the the, the movies are way better than the books. Like the, the yeah. books are getting way too into detail and and so on. But, and there's a little bit of that in in Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire, where there's there's these like branching stories and and like side stories that they just skipped in the TV show. And then okay. the fans were complaining, and I was more like, "Yeah, great! I we don't need to hear that story. That didn't really add anything to the main uh, right. part." And then, obviously, in the well, we haven't seen the the end of the books yet, but the the TV show didn't end that well in a lot of you know people's right. opinion. And and I don't think that's where the books are heading because they somewhere uh, 
it, it branches off and it starts being its own thing on the TV show that. Yeah, that's true. I'm curious to see how that the, how, how, how the books differ from the end. I think part, maybe part of the problem of the end of the series is that it, it felt a little rushed to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe the, the books have more time. You can, you can type as many words as he wants to get that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's doing that as well because you know, it's been <laughs> forever. So. Right, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, it's been great having you on on the show here and, and talking yeah. about your game. And I I mean, in the future, obviously, I'll, I'll be back covering this game at some point and uh, and you know making making playthroughs and so on. Uh, speaking of that, how's how's the solo? I mean, I see it's one to six players here. I, I assume you have a solo mode yeah. that's well thought out as well. I, I am as usual. I am not the solo designer, but uh, Automa Factory. Oh yeah, by, yeah. by Morton. Who does the solo modes for all of our games? He created a, a really really cool solo system for this game. It's probably one of the more robust. Like it's not complicated, but it he did some really really cool things with it. So I'm very curious to see what you think when when you get to play that. Yeah, yeah I look forward to it. And I mean, I feel like there's a, a good development on that area as well. I mean, looking at the, I mean, the Atoma in Uidi culture was was fine. And then one of my favorite games, Gaia Project. Uh, introduced this well, the Automa factory introduced this with two cards, and then you have that in Tapestry as well with two cards for the Automa. So, yeah, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to I can see that e improving even more as time goes by, right? Yeah, they're they're constantly developing the format uh, so that it, it, and it, the, it, for those who don't know too much about it, that their key philosophy is they want to simulate an intelligent opponent without requiring you to actually take all the steps to play again, to run another player yeah. so that you can just focus on what you're doing. And, and I think they do a fantastic job of that. And I, as a publisher, I've kind of given them free reign to use whatever components they need to make that possible. Yeah, I, I think that's great to have a, I mean, that's also a strength to see that like, okay, you're not doing all of the steps. Like they, they are good at this right. part, then they do that part and you do your part and so on. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it doesn't feel forced as well. I think, I mean, especially lately, that you know, every game has a solo mode. And and some yeah. games, it feels a little bit forced. Like, well, we have to have a solo mode for our game. Uh, so, yeah. so just seeing that it's actually uh, an integrated part of, of the game itself uh, from the from the start. That, that, that Okay. Well, thank you so much for the chat, Jamie. It's, yeah, it's it was been great, great to chat with you. Um, Maybe I'll I'll, I'll uh, ask you in, in a while again to get back. You know, <laughs> when you have absolutely. I mean, I think we have a lot to talk about in in the sense of it, it's interesting. It's I must say it's interesting as well with you because you're you're a game designer and you know publishing and but you're also like a YouTuber. You also have this perspective from like playing different games, talking about them, making top lists, and analyzing uh, game mechanics and so on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But one of the reasons I love talking with fellow content creators, just to see your perspectives and your methods. That's always interesting for me. Yeah. If you haven't already, uh, you know, you can check out the uh, Red Rising and the Stone Wire Games uh, webpage and, and Jamie's YouTube channel as well will be linked in the show notes here. So thank you. All right. So yeah, that was the, the chat there with Jamie. Uh, really fun doing it. Um, I look forward to doing something else in the future together with him. I mean, I, I really like his games. I like his attitude and, and his whole take on on gaming. I think that's a really healthy one. Or it's you know or have about having fun and enjoying, uh, you know, social socializing with people, gaming, and yeah. So well, I look forward to that. And now let's head into the next part of the podcast here where I'll talk a bit about well I'm going to answer some questions that you guys sent me so and also you know I want more questions uh, into the podcast so send it to bgwniramas at gmail.com and how do you spell that well you know it's in the description here for the podcast as well and you can find it on YouTube as well on the YouTube page uh, so, um, so send me emails send me your questions about like game related stuff or about me or Draco or Sweden or whatever uh, you know, anything that could be fun, just don't be shy, just send me some questions. And I, I will start off here uh, with James, who sent me a question here asking me about two player games. And he's asking, uh, well, sort of, what are my favorite two player games? What can I recommend? And so on. And like, I, I, I done a two top 10 list for two player games, but I think it's, it's over a year old 
uh, maybe one and a half years since I did that. But the thing is, I think back then, I don't really actually remember. I think it was Keyforge. Well, it was Keyforge that I put as number one because I played a lot of Keyforge back then. But to be honest, these days, it is Seven Wonders Duel. I think it was my number two on that list, but Seven Wonders Duel. And again, I love Keyforge, but I'm not really sure I would recommend it just to anyone because like, it's gotten more complicated. Keyforge used to be simpler or like more straightforward, more streamlined, but then they released this new sets of decks, right? And then it gets more and more complex. So if you just want to like try it out, you know, just have a, like a lot of people are game with their partner and so on. I think Seven Wonders Duel is, is a lot of better option there. And it's so good. You can play the base game. It's, you know, fairly cheap to pick up. It's easy to get into, but there's a lot of strategy. It's amazing how much strategy is in that game. Just a few cards, right? And tokens and yeah, a lot of gaming in there and you don't really need to enjoy like I like civilization games and like the conflict of it and all but I think most people would enjoy this anyway even if you're not that into civilization games because the theme is, is mostly of course pasted on uh, but the mechanics of the game the like open draft you have these cards out on the table and you take turns taking a card and like as you take a card that will make your opponent you know, available to take the next one in this sort of pyramid. And some of them will be hidden. So when you take a card, that will like reveal new cards and that might mess it up for you because then all of a sudden your opponent can get one of those cards that they really need. And then if you enjoy it, then you can also get the expansions, which are awesome. It's some of the best expansions ever. Uh, Pantheon is the first one. And the new one that came last year was Agora. Both of them are really, really good. And playing with all of that together, such a good game. But at that point, it's more like, a, it's a longer game. <laughs> it's not just... That's quick and easy to play to play a game. And you can also play it on Board Game Arena, which I do a lot these days. I play a lot of Seven Wonders Duel. So yeah, so James, I can really recommend you to check that out if you haven't. Now, if you want something sort of a little bit different, like, I don't know how to explain that, but like, it's still conflict and it's even more war themed, but it's a two player game that I think a lot of Euro gamers would appreciate as well. It's Undaunted. So Undaunted, there's Undaunted um, Normandy and there's Undaunted North Africa. This is the same game basically, it just have a little bit of different things in them, but those games are deck building. So if you enjoy, if you enjoy deck building, like, you know, picking up cards, making your deck better, um, and you're fighting out on a map, but the, the really cool thing here is that you're like losing cards from your deck as well, because uh, when you shoot at your opponent, if you get a hit, they have to discard or like get rid of a card from their deck. So that that's an interesting twist on a classic deck building mechanic as well. So Undaunted, I can also recommend. And there's a bunch of good two-player games. We might get back to that later on here as well. Next up, we have Daniel, who sent a bunch of questions. So I'll just run through them. So we start off here with Daniel is saying that he knows the story about Draco and um, uh, so wh why he... So why did he become the mascot here? <laughs> and and are dragons my favorite mythical animal? I think so. I mean, I I really like dragons. I, I cried like a little kid when, well, spoiler, when one of the dragons died in Game of Thrones. <laughs> I, I really like dragons. And, and I don't really have any other like mythical animal that I like. I, I can't really recall any. And to be honest, it's, I mean, Draco, you know, Draco and I met before I started YouTubing. Uh, so then, you know, Draco was hanging out at my house. And then when I started YouTubing, I mean, he fit the, he's very cute. <laughs> and then he he's also has a very special look, right? So branding wise to make a channel to stand out. I mean, if you scroll YouTube in, in a feed and you see one of my videos, you can see that it's my video because Draco is there. So he's really, you know, good look for he's good as a mascot he's also my co-host i mean draco and i play games together and he's he's a real gamer so yeah i mean he's just a, just a good guy next up here daniel's asking what are my go-to video and board games from young days for which i would like a rework or facelift in modern days that is a hard question um i do remember as a kid i, I do remember enjoying some i mean we have this like tradition in sweden of Swedish um, like game company or publisher uh, and they've been making I don't really know if they're that active these days but like back you know like 20 30 years ago they made a lot of sort of Swedish board games I don't even think those were like sold anywhere else uh, so 
a lot of kids in Sweden have grown up playing these games. Um, and I mean, some of them, like the, I think the most famous one really is like the Dragon Castle, which turned into, I think, Dungeon Quest. So it was released in English as well. It's, it's like a classic, like, like a sort of, I would say if you played Clank, <laughs> it, it doesn't have the same mechanic. It does, it's not a deck builder, but it's the same idea of going into a dungeon and, and like picking up loot, like pushing your luck. And then if the dragon wakes up, uh, you will you might die and you need to make it out there with loot as well. And it's, you know, really fun. I played that as a kid and, and you know, I played Dungeon Quest as a grown up as well. Uh, and I love Clank. So, I mean, I, I like that whole idea of the push your luck, right? Um, so, but if there's any game I would like to see a rework for, I don't think so. I mean, most of these games that I remember from my childhood, they're, they're not that great, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and I think it's sad, like with the, I mean, like Monopoly and Risk and all those games. I think it's sad that a lot of people that are not into gaming, con like that's the board game. If, if you say that you're into board gaming, that's what they think of. And... That's what they, you know, keep buying to their kids. But there's so many good games out there. And I'm, I don't like the whole hating on Monopoly and all that. It's just silly. I, I'm more joke about that. But at the same time, there's so many good games. Like, why sit around playing those games? Uh, there's no reason. So, yeah, of course. I think I think generally I like newer games. I like modern game design. Uh, yeah. So then Daniel is asking, who is my favorite designer? Uh, it's also a hard question. All of these are hard questions in a sense. But... I think I will have to say Stefan Feld. Um, just looking at what games I like and what games I play that I enjoy, like a, a regular... Yeah, if it's a Stefan Feld game, I will most likely enjoy it, more or less. Um, yeah, and I met him. I met, met him at Essen Spiel. Uh, seemed to be a really nice guy. He didn't speak that much English, I think. <laughs> but yeah, so I think it's Stefan Feld. But then, of course, I, I will say I like, you know, a bunch of designers. I mean, of course, like Jamie uh, that we just had on here, a uh, great designer. And there's a bunch of good designers. I, I don't think I... I mean, some people have, like, a really strong... I know a lot of people, like, love Ryan Lockett, for example. Like, if, if he releases a game, they are instantly excited. I am too, but like I, I love you know near and far, but then like I, above and below was not that great in my. I mean, it's like I, I don't know if I care that much about designers as some do. Uh, a lot of like YouTubers and so on, they really talk about a lot about the designer. And of course, they should get credit credit to designer, uh, obviously, but you know, I I there's a lot of good games that are like games that I really enjoy, but I haven't really played much else of that designer if you know what i'm saying so i don't know if i, I really can say that i'm I, I it's not the first thing maybe i look at when i when a new game comes out it's almost more a publisher in some way like there's some publishers that i like everything they release i want to play i don't know <laughs> all right is there a game that comes to mind that you were super hyped about and then totally disappointed after you played it well i think the most the most like if you if we're gonna talk about the the length like or like the between how excited I was and how disappointed I was, I think it would be Discover Lands Unknown. That was Fantasy Flight Games. It came out like I think Essen 2018. It was like a secret release, so it wasn't on the Essen list before. Uh we went down there, me and my friends, to Essen Spiel. And then oh, Fantasy Flight has this new cool game. So it's like this you know exploration i love that in games i mean it, it kind of looked a little bit like oh it could be a little bit like seven continent or something and it had this whole thing which like key forge that was released at the same time i think it has whole thing and i was just you know i just fallen in love with key forge basically and like oh all the games were unique but this is like a 50 60 you know dollar game board game and then your game is unique and then you can you know i, I can play through it and then i can like share it with a friend and they will have a different experience it didn't work out. Uh, it was, I think it was a cool idea, but it didn't work out. And I don't think anyone's really playing that game anymore. And I played it a while and I just realized, well, this is so generic. <laughs> this is like, I don't know, it was so bad. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the one that I've been the most disappointed in. Is there a great game that I love and for which I w would rip the rule book apart and write it on your own? No, I don't like writing rule books. I have to write the rulebook for Dracula's Adventure and I don't want to. 
<laughs> but I see what Daniel is saying here. Like, a great game that has a bad rule book. Well, there's a few of those, I guess. I think one of the most annoying rule books I remember reading was the... Um... It, it was for, for Keyflower. I don't think Keyflower is that great of a game, though. I think it's okay. It's an okay Euro game. But that rule book is terrible. I remember, like, playing it wrong and then, like, going back and forth, like, watching Board Game Geek, like, clarifying stuff. And, oh, wow. Well, another one I would say that is a great game and has an annoying rule book is Robinson Crusoe. But I, I that has been improved. Like, the first edition I remember playing and, and it was really hard to find things in the rule book and so on. But I have, like, the third edition now and I think it's okay. So maybe that's the one. Yeah. So what do I value most in a fellow player in my group? I will say, actually, the thing I value most when I play with people is people that are relaxed and just, like, have this, the, the same commitment level that I have, which means, like, I, I don't like it when people are... I mean, I play with some people that, like, don't care at all about how they do in the game and they just, you know, want to talk about other stuff. I don't like that. That's annoying. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I really don't like people that are very competitive. I mean, board gaming for me is not about like, oh, I have to win, I have to beat everyone, I have to do the optimal move every time, and if I make a wrong move, then I'm going to be like uh, bashing myself for days. That's just annoying to me. I mean, go play Magic the Gathering or some like competitive game in that case. I don't think that kind of attitude belongs at all in the board gaming, in my board gaming community at least. I want to have fun and relax, but of course we want to win, but if we don't win, who cares? I mean... One thing I really like, one of my, you know, favorite people in the world to play board games with is my friend Andreas. Because he has this attitude, like, he wins a lot of times, and he's doing good moves, and he's taking a long time thinking <laughs> sometimes. But he also likes to try things in games. Like, he, he doesn't he doesn't try to look for the perfect strategy to win, like, rest, Great Western Trail, and then just keep doing that so that he wins. You know, he wants to like, oh, well, maybe I can win this way. He wants to try different ways to play the game, different ways to win. And if he doesn't win, well, you know, he had a good time. So I, I like that attitude. I think that's the thing I value the most in a player that I play board games with. Um, I mean, that, yeah, that, absolutely. And final question here from Daniel is, what is something that you hate most in a game night? And he has some examples here of like mishandling games, people that are on phones... Analy analysis paralysis, uh, also known as AP. Uh, well, that, I mean, he. I agree with you, Daniel. That's like, if I have to pick one thing that I really hate the most in game nights, well, except, well, I, I do, again, I don't like the whole super competitive, like, oh, I have to take, you know, five minutes to think this through so that I do the exact perfect and I get like one more point. I don't like that stuff. But I also don't like it when, I think it's, in some ways, it's even worse with people that, you know, like people on the phones, that's like totally off limits. That's not, not allowed in my in, in not my game group, but like in the game group I play a lot with back in the days right before the pandemic. Um, that That's not okay. And and also, that I played with some people that have been like leaving the game like halfway through because like, oh, I'm not going to win. So I'm going to like make up an excuse to like, I have to go, go home, whatever. Like that's like just bad behavior uh, it happens very ra you know rarely though so but i mean i don't like any of this like of course mishandling games and i also have an issue with maybe i have a little bit of like an ocd there because i have an issue with people that are just like putting stuff all over the place if the especially if the game like a lot of games a lot of euro games they have like your player board and they have like specific spots where you're supposed to put like oh put your discard pile over there put your tokens over there and then people just put them somewhere else and just like doesn't care that bugs me i know it's silly but you know i'm honest about it i i can really be annoyed especially you know if it's something that like and then the, it's their turn and they're like oh wait where did i put my stuff well if you had put it in the right place like the game designer intended to from the start then you would have your turns would have been half the time and the other people sitting around here didn't need to wait for you so <laughs> yeah yeah well all right, and uh, finally here uh, we have a question from, um, I, I, I don't know if like this is some kind of username here, so I don't know, I'm not going to 
get it, like try to pronounce that. But anyway, so the question here is about Draco. So what games do Draco like? Well, Draco is a, you know, he's an omni gamer, just like me. He likes a lot of different games. But I will say that Draco really likes games with cute components. I think, you know, we share that, me and Draco. So if there's like, he really likes past the pigs because there's like cute rubber pigs that you throw around. Draco thinks that's funny. Well, we, I don't really like that game too much, but yeah, he's not that into... Draco likes pretty stuff. Let's just put it that way. All right, now let's head to the next segment. And again, I will ask you, send your questions to me, bgwneramas at gmail.com. So I will answer them in the next podcast. And now let's head to the next segment where we talk a little bit about the future. All right, so we're back for the last segment here where I talk about what's upcoming and so on. And, you know, not just YouTube, but like generally in my, my life and in what's going on. And I will say that, I talked earlier about the Swedish winter and all that, but now we are starting to head into spring. I've been taking some walks and, you know, sun is out. <laughs> it's still cold in the air, but I do like being able to take my walks. And it's, it's fascinating. I live on the coast. So I walk down to the ocean here and the ice is breaking up. And it's it's an interesting thing to see how, like, the nature is transforming, right? Uh, we're starting to, like, in just a few weeks here, there's going to be like some, some flowers and some birds and all that out there. I love spring. Uh, it's one of, I think it's my favorite season of the year because it's, it feels so much like hope. Like, wow, things are getting better. Now we ha I have feel like I have a bunch of months ahead of me where I will be able to be outside and you know, just enjoy good weather and, you know, the Swedish summer and all that. So uh, I feel hopeful. Uh, I'm waiting for the vaccine. I do really hope that the vaccine shows up soon here. Uh, of course, you know, a lot of people, like a half a million has already been vaccinated in Sweden, but they're doing it like, of course, in groups. Uh, so I'm, you know, I have to wait a little bit more, but I, I hope it's just gonna be smooth and, and run well with my body and that I will be able to relax a little bit more after that, you know, be able to go to some game nights and meet some people, meet friends and family. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen my, my dad uh, in, in a long time. Uh, so I really, yeah, I really look forward to that. It's It's gonna be I really hope it's gonna work as I picture it in my head. Like you know, you take the you take the shots, uh, you wait a few weeks, and then it's okay. Uh, I mean, there's also the risk, of course, of like side effects and all that. But I try to not think about that because it's not an option for me. I have to take the vaccine. Uh, I can't gamble on that. So yeah, I really hope that that will be happening soon. And and together with the whole spring coming, um, you know, meeting people and so on. I think that's gonna do a lot for my mental health. Uh, then game wise, I am excited now this week. I am going to uh, I, I have Terraforming Mars the dice game. I have it uh, on my table and um, So I am excited to it's a prototype from Freaks games I should say that it's not released yet. Obviously, it's coming I think next year But I'm gonna make a playthrough with the prototype and I look forward to doing that I, I played the prototype in like earlier iterations like uh, two years ago and so on together with the Fricks Brothers, but I look forward to, to trying it out now and I'll, I'll make a playthrough with Draco, so I, that's going to be fun. And then on my table also I have X-Men Mutant Insurrection, which I'm not that excited for, but I like X-Men and it looks like a lightweight, fun little, you know, combat game, like, you know, co-op game. So I'll do a playthrough of that as well. And, and then I have some other stuff coming in the mail. A bunch of games and I have Fan Thunder card game. There's another game that I, I just received the other day uh, It was on Kickstarter. I made a Kickstarter video and now I got the um, final cop, you know printing of it So I look forward to trying that out in the final printing and it's a fun sort of adventure style a sort of a You know thematic game with cards and, and I like how it works the mechanics. It, it reminds me a little bit of of these like games like Marvel Champions, I haven't played it, but I've seen it, and I, I think it's very similar to that. And, and that's also a game I would like to pick up, actually, Marvel Champions. And, you know, I, I kind of catch up on that. I think I would enjoy it. I just watched the basically all the Marvel movies uh, during like a month, sitting at home, you know, locked down. So I'm I'm sort of into the Marvel universe a little bit now, and I, I enjoy it more than I used to do back in the days. Actually, um, I still think Iron Man is my favorite. Um, I think it's it gets a little bit out out of there when it's like Thor and 
different worlds and whatnot, but but yeah, I like it. So uh, yeah, there, there's a bunch of games here that are come upcoming. I my tempo is a bit lower though, uh, but I hope that it's gonna pick up with like, you know, the more I go outside, get sun and all that, get some D vitamin D in me, uh, my energy levels will pick up and I can start you know making more content. But so next up here, uh, X Men, and then of course Terraforming Mars, the dice game. That's the main two uh, things I have planned for this week here. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna end the podcast here. I don't want it to be too long. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you did, you know, give me some feedback. You know, is there a, is there a segment that you would like to have in here? Is there a segment you want me to shorten? Um, I mean, I would like to ask. I would like to answer more questions. So if you want to send me questions, that would be great because that's always fun. It's always fun to interact with the people listening, right? And of course, you can you know go check out my videos on YouTube if you haven't already. I think most people that are all listening here also are following me on YouTube. But if you're not, then go check it out. You know, a bunch of videos, like 1,100 something videos out there, which is insane. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, thank you for listening. And you know, Draco is waving his tail here. He looks happy. Um, thank you for all the support that you give for, for the channel and for my content creation. I really appreciate it. So have a great evening, morning, or whenever you're watching. No, sorry, listening. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>